morning everyone myself dr ashwina tripura sundari senior resident faculty in department of respiratory medicine in sri lakshmi narayana institute of medical sciences pondicherry today we will discuss about pneumonia pleural effusion and bronchial asthma first we will see about pneumonia so under pneumonia we will discuss about definition pathogenesis classification clinical features bacterial pneumonia viral pneumonia fungal pneumonia protozoal pneumonia and atypical pneumonia and also the diagnostic approach radiology anatomical classification community occurring pneumonia nosocomial pneumonia complications risk factors for adverse outcome differential diagnosis and prevention so definition of pneumonia pneumonia is defined as inflammation of pulmonary parenchyma caused by a infectious agent pathogenesis of pneumonia pneumonia is predisposed by conditions including which reduces or suppression of the cough impairs mucociliary activity reduces the effective phagocytic activity of alveolar macrophages and neutrophils impairs the immunoglobulin production pathogens which have got the potential to cause pneumonia reach the lung mainly by the micro aspiration of secretions containing oropharyngeal flora other method include overt aspiration inhalation from environment and blood spread sometimes pathogen spread directly from a adjacent extra pulmonary site of infection such as mediastinum chest wall spine and abdominal cavity so what are the pathology of lobar pneumonia there are four pathological phases congestion red hepatization gray hepatization and resolution congestion uh, extend for 1 to 2 days red hepatization for 2 to 4 days gray hepatization for 4 to 8 days resolution begin after 8 to 10 days so in congestion phase pulmonary capillaries get dilated and serous flow leak out capillaries into the alveolus the patient is feverish with sob breathlessness and cough breath red hepatization extend for 2 to 4 days that is mean the lung look like a red liver the affected lobe is solid as the alveoli are full of rbcs neutrophils and fibrinous excreting instead of air so there is no gas exit in this lobe the patient become breathless and hypoxic the cough is blade blood stain or rusty sputum gray hepatization go for 4 to 8 days the affected part look like gray liver the alveoli are full of neutrophils and dense fibrous strand the patient cough 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 purulent sputum and remain breathless resolution begin after 8 to 10 days without antibiotic monocyte clear the inflammatory debris and the normal air filled lung oxygen is restored improvement of the patient condition seen during resolution phase so this picture showing all the four pathology stages of lobar pneumonia first one is the stage of congestion here you can see active hyperemia and edema stage of red hepatization is the second phase here the alveoli will be filled with neutrophils congestion and fibrin and the third phase is the stage of gray hepatization here there is a degradation of red blood cells and fibrin of separative exudate seen fourth phase is the stage of resolution which is the healing phase monocyte clear the inflammation and repair the lung architecture back to normal so we can categorize pneumonia by clinical setting in many ways first is the community occur pneumonia it include typical classic pneumonia atypical pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia pneumonia in the elderly it include community acquired and nursing home resident nosocomial pneumonia it include hospital acquired pneumonia ventilator associated pneumonia healthcare associated pneumonia pneumonia in immunocompromised host immunoglobulin and complement deficiencies granulocyte dysfunction or deficiency which can be seen in cyclic neutropenia chronic granulomatous disease leukocyte adhesion defect myeloperoxidase or g6pd deficiency innate immune defect natural killer cell deficiency defect of interleukin or interferon gamma pathway pattern recognition receptor pathway defect cellular and combined immune deficiency neoplastic disease 
Notably, hematopoietic malignancy and therapies, solid organ and hematopoietic transplant recipients, untreated HIV infection, immune reconstitution syndrome, severe commune immunodeficiencies, kid and congenital deficiencies, autoimmune and connective tissue disorder, other immunocompromised patients. Cystic fibrosis and anatomic disorder, bronchopulmonary sequestration, brachiomalacia or bronchomalacia. So this was the categorization of pneumonia by clinical setting. So clinical futures of pneumonia, systemic clinical futures and lung clinical futures both are there. Systemic futures include high fever which is in skin it can be uh, blueness which is the cyanosis. In lungs it present with cough with sputum, shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis. Pleuritic chest pain is shock, pain, pricking pain, which is aggravated with deep inspiration and it mostly it won't be radiating or referring. It will be a localized pain. Muscular fatigue and muscle ache, central <coughs> CNS symptoms, headache and other symptoms, loss of appetite, mood swing, low BP, blood pressure and high heart rate, tachycardia, gastric symptoms, nausea and vomiting and joint pain can be present. So what are the signs of pneumonia? Pneumonia can present with decreased chest movements, dull on percussion, vocal fremitus or vocal dissonance will be increased. Bronchial type of breathing will be present. Bronchial breath zone will be present. And bronchophony, egophony and whispering tetralogy may can be present. Crepitations also can be present, which will be mostly a fine crepitation. And the breath zone will be a tubular bronchial breath zone most of the time here. There. So what are the bacterial pneumonias? Bacterial pneumonia more common caused by streptococcus pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia caused by Legionella species, Mycoplasma pneumonia, Chlamydia species, Coxella burnetti. Staphylococcal pneumonia is due to Staphylococcus aureus. Gram-negative enteric pneumonia is due to Klebsiella species, Pseudomonas serogenesa, E. coli, Enterobacter species, Serratia species, Hemophilus influenza pneumonia, Moraxella catalyst pneumonia. These are the other. And anaerobic pneumonia caused by bacterial species, Fusobacterium species, Peptococcus species, Peptostreptococcus species. Mycobacterium pneumonia can be caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, what can be the clinical future of bacterial pneumonia? The onset will be often sudden, high grade fever, chills and rigors, sputum is rusty color or blood stained. Viral pneumonia, the most important causes are influenza, para-influenza, measles, respiratory essential virus, varicella, cytomegalovirus. The risk factors for viral pneumonia are old age and children, chronic disease of the heart, lung or kidney, women in the last trimester of pregnancy. Clinical futures include dry cough, dyspnea and malaise, unremarkable physical examination findings, Chest X-ray can show interstitial pattern. Complication can include influenza induces necrosis of the respiratory epithelium, which predisposes to secondary bacterial colonization, like streptococcus pneumonia or staph aureus. So fungal pneumonia, fungi that can cause pneumonia are histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, cryptococcus, sporotrichosis, primarily a lymphocutaneous disease, but it can involve the lungs as well. Other fungi are Aspergillus, Candida, Cochidiodiomycosis. Clinical features of fungal pneumonia. It can occur in a particular setting. History of immunosuppression like AIDS, malignancy, corticosteroid therapy, radiation therapy, anti malignant drugs can be present. Debilitated, bedridden people, malnutrition are also a risk factor for getting fungal pneumonia. Patient can have chronic serious pre existing disease. Clinical future of fungal pneumonia. People working in agricultural land, caves, old buildings, places of bird dropping, soil, they, can, they are all more risk of getting fungal pneumonia. The disease usually have a run of chronic host. That is the, the symptom duration will be chronic in a fungal pneumonia. Protozoal pneumonia. Parasite causing protozoal pneumonia are Toxoplasma gondii, <coughs> Strongolites red coloris, Ascariasis, Cryptosporidia, Hoopworm. Protozoal or parasitic pneumonia. A variety of parasites can affect the lung. This parasite usually 
typically will enter the body through the skin or being swallowed once inside they travel through the lung usually through the blood one type of white blood cell that is the eosinophils cells respond vigorously through parasite infection in the lung so eosinophil in the lung will lead to eosinophilic pneumonia <coughs> atypical pneumonia atypical pneumonia <coughs> also called as walking pneumonia this are caused by the atypical pathogens mycoplasma chlamydia and legionella here the systemic manifestations will be dominant generalized myalgia muscle ache arthralgia and the diarrhea nausea vomiting abdominal pain also can be common it will be gradual in onset it will be low grade fever and it can be present with breakup complete blood count picture shows absent leukocytosis this is very important usually any infection in the body will have to present with leukocytosis but atypical pneumonia will have absent leukocytosis and they do not respond to common antibiotic they do not form lower consolidation rather it restricted through small areas in the lung so what are the causes of atypical pneumonia mycoplasma pneumoniae under chlamydophila family chlamydophila cytokine chlamydophila pneumoniae and the bacteria legionella transcellular tolerances yersinia pestis bacillus anthracis which are the agents of the bioterrorism and fungi histoplasma blastomyces coccidios hemocystis aspiration pneumonitis sterile or mixed upper respiratory and oral flora viral agent include respiratory tract virus influenza adenovirus respiratory essential virus para influenza virus metanemo virus varicella zoster measles epstein barr virus cytomegaloma virus anta virus under rickets ca coxilla burnetti q fever so how we will go for a routine evaluation of patient with suspected pneumonia in history age community uh, which community the patient is from uh, respiratory viruses and antimicrobial resistance are more common in some areas and if it is he got hospitalized because of the ventilator etiology he may get pneumonia then uh, how is the onset of the symptom how is the dyspnea and many history of recent infection post viral pneumonia endocarditis aspiration so it can should be sorted out the recent hospitalization or exposure to medical facilities any extended care in the hospital and any underlying condition in already any altered mental status immunity cardiopulmonary and medication history should be kept exposures any illness children institution animal gardens travel so which may go have a risk of getting pneumonia antimicrobial therapy sport infusion therapy vaccination history should be taken duration of hospitalization or endotracheal intubation should be asked in physical examination under lab investigations complete blood count with differential count electrolytes liver function test the urea nitrogen creatinine to be get and radiology chest x ray pa and lateral radi chest radiography depend on on the host and severity of illness should be taken consider chest ct with contrast echocardiogram thoracocentesis if it's needed microbiology adapted to the clinical setting and severity of illness sputum gram strain culture and sensitivity susceptibility testing nasal swab direct immunofluorescence for respiratory virus panel influenza respiratory essential virus para influenza adenovirus and metanemo virus this may need nasal swab testing blood cultures two blood cultures and consider this following test in any appropriate setting hemococcal urinary antigen legionella urinary antigen histoplasma urinary antigen acid for smear modified acid for smear and culture acute and convalescent sera mycoplasma chlamydophila q fever coxilla burnetti histoplasma coccidiosis tularemia anthrax and hiv status molecular assays cytomegalovirus epstein barr virus and adenovirus so what are the radiological presentations of pneumonia radiological has some classifications anatomical classification loba pneumonia bronco pneumonia and interstitial pneumonia loba pneumonia means the consolidation in both all or part of low bronco pneumonia is the infection of the terminal bronchial that extend into the cerebral surrounding alveoli which result in patchy consolidation of the lung interstitial pneumonia is as in viral pneumonia where the inflammatory infiltrate involve many interstitial tissue between the alveoli so loba pneumonia most common seen in streptococcus pneumonia and klebsiella pneumonia this x ray picture showed a right upper zone consolidation 
which is the lobar pneumonia. Bronchopneumonia most common seen in Streptococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumonia, mycoplasma, and chlamydia. Here bilateral diffusely patchy patchy infiltrate seen. This is the bronchopneumonia. Interstitial pneumonia most common seen in virus and mycoplasma. Here the infiltrate seen in like a interstitial pattern. It follows the interstitial reticular markings like seen in the bilateral all zones of the lung. So what is community acquired pneumonia? Community acquired pneumonia is defined as acute infection of the pulmonary parenchyma in a patient who has acute the infection in the community as distinguished from the hospital acute nosocomial pneumonia. Community acquired pneumonia is the most common cause of CPS sepsis. Despite introduction of antibiotic, imaging modality and biomarker testing, mortality is related to community acquired pneumonia has not changed significantly. More cases occur during the winter months. It occur more common in men than women, more common in black persons compared to Caucasian. The etiology of community acquired pneumonia varies by geographic region. However, Streptococcus pneumonia is the most commonly identified bacterial cause of community acquired pneumonia worldwide. Virus is also common cause of community acquired pneumonia. So, what is the management? If it is uncomplicated community acquired pneumonia, then the outpatient treatment, empirical treatment is if the patient is previously healthy and he has no antibiotic use in the past three months, he should be given a macrolide, clarithromycin or azithromycin or doxycycline. Comorbidities or history of antibiotic use in the previous three months if present, then the patient should be given respiratory fluoroquinone, moxifloxin, levofloxin or any beta lactam, high dose amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulin. If the patient is admitted, inpatient treatment is in non-ICU, a respiratory fluoroquinone, moxifloxin, levofloxin, even, or as a beta lactam, cipotaxin, septriaxin, ampicillin, plus a macrolide, oral clarithromycin or azithromycin given. If the patient is admitted in ICU inpatient, then the treatment is beta lactam plus azithromycin or a fluoroquinone. So if the suspected pathogen is pseudomonas, an anti pseudomonal beta lactam, pepresilin, tesobactam, cefepime, imipenam, meropenam, plus fluoroquinone can be given. And or is the above beta lactam plus amino glycosid or azithromycin given. Or is the above beta lactam plus amino glycosid plus anti pneumococcal fluoroquinone given. If the pathogen is suspected is methicillin resistant, cephalococcus aureus, add linozolid or vancomycin. So, nosocomial pneumonia. Nosocomial pneumonia remains an important etiology of healthcare associated infection. And it consists of three distinct entities healthcare associated pneumonia. Hospital acute pneumonia and ventilator associated pneumonia. So, healthcare associated pneumonia defined as pneumonia diagnosed in any patient who was hospitalized in an acute care hospital for two or more days within 90 days of diagnosis. Pneumonia it is decided in a nursing home or a long term care facility. If you receive recent intravenous antibiotic therapy, chemotherapy, or wound care within the past 30 days of the current infection, if he has attended the hospital or the hemodialysis clinic. So, if any of this history is present and the patient should be suspected for healthcare associated pneumonia. Hospital acute pneumonia is defined as pneumonia diagnosed 48 hours or more after the hospital admission. Ventilator associated pneumonia is defined as pneumonia diagnosed 48 hours or more after the endotracheal incubation. So, what are the etiological agents in nosocomial pneumonia? Etiological agents varies with underlying disease and it varies with geography, ICU population, duration of mechanical ventilation, previous antibiotic therapy, and the method used to obtain respiratory cultures. All will have variation depending on the etiological agents in nosocomial pneumonia. So, aerobic gram-negative bacilli represent the most prevalent pathogens causing nosocomial pneumonia, 58%, which include Enterobacteriaceae group, Klebsiella, E. coli, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Proteus, and Serratia species. Additional gram-negative bacilli include Pseudomonas, Acinobacter, and Chenotrophomonas species. With the emergence of multidrug-resistant pathogens, 
gram positive organisms mainly medicinal resistant staph aureus have become a increasingly important cause of platelet associated pneumonia and anaerobes fungi and legionella species are uncommon causes of platelet associated pneumonia but cases have been reported most of common pneumonia antimicrobial treatment include broad spectrum penicillin third and fourth generation cyclosporins carbapenem quinolones aminoglycosides vancomycin linozolid so what are the complications of pneumonia it can be para pneumonic effusion which is most common empyema reduction of sputum which cause the lobar colors bronchopleural fistula organizing pneumonia bronchiectasis deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism hypoxemia pneumothorax uh, particularly if the positive organism is staphylococcus aureus it can lead to formation of pneumotoxins which can rupture into the pleural space which can cause pneumothorax and any suppurative pneumonia or lung abscess ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome renal failure multi organ failure atlet abscess respiratory failure which require mechanical ventilator ectopic abscess formation staphylococcal aureus in which the ectopic abscess formation more common hepatitis pericarditis myocarditis meningitis and septitis so the infections can spread anywhere into the body which will lead to all this complications so what are the risk factor for the adverse outcome of a patient in pneumonia alcohol consumption increase in age lipopenia congestive heart failure coronary artery disease diabetes mellitus immunocompromised neurological disease active malignancy clinical signs which include dyspnea or tachypnea hypothermia chills hypotension confusion or altered mental status lab test include hyponatremia hyperglycemia azotemia hyperalbuminemia liver function test abnormalities radiological infiltrate and pleural effusions post obstructive pneumonia if any of this features present patient or risk of getting deterioration and adverse outcome and uh, under microbiology gram negative bacilli staphylococcal aureus mixer for aspiration bacteremia or more prone of patient getting adverse outcome so what are the differential diagnosis of pneumonia pulmonary infarction pulmonary or pleural tuberculosis pulmonary edema if it can be unilateral pulmonary eosinophilia malignancy bronco alveolar cell carcinoma rare disorder cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or, or uh, bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia book venous thromboembolism pulmonary hemorrhage ards acute respiratory distress syndrome and drug toxicity so preventive pressures for pneumonia current smoker should be advised to stop smoking influenza vaccine and pneumococcal vaccine should be considered in selected patient most commonly in COPD patient in developing countries tackling uh, malnutrition and indoor air pollution is important immunization against measles pertussis and haemophilus influenza type b in children should be advised legionella pneumophila as important public health complication so it usually require notification to the appropriate health authority so whenever a legionella infection is identified it should be immediately notified to the health authority as it can occur in a many group of people at a time so this is all about pneumonia next we will discuss about pleural effusion so uh, what is a pleural effusion pleural effusion is defined as a abnormal collection of fluid in the pleural space resulting from excess fluid production or decreased absorption or both it is the most common manifestation of pleural abscess so hemothorax is defined as collection of blood in pleural space chylothorax is defined as accumulation of chyle chyle is nothing but lymph with fat in the pleural space empyema is the first collection in the pleural space so pleural effusion is a indicator of underlying disease process which can be either pulmonary or non pulmonary in origin and it can be acute or chronic although the etiologic spectrum of pleural effusion is extensive most pleural effusions are caused by congestive heart failure pneumonia malignancy or pulmonary embolism so the most common causes of pleural effusion are these four congestive heart failure pneumonia malignancy or pulmonary embolism 
So there are very different mechanisms pathophysiology the for fluid effusion. Reduction in intravascular oncotic pressure. Example, hypoalbuminemia, which can occur in nephrotic syndrome or cirrhosis. Increased capillary permeability or vascular disruption, which can occur in trauma, malignancy, inflammation, infection, pulmonary infarction, drug hypersensitivity, uremia, pancreatitis. Increased capillary hydrostatic pressure in the systemic or on the pulmonary circulation, which can occur in congestive heart failure. Reduction of pressure in the pleural space, preventing the whole full expansion of the lung or the trap lung. Extensive atelite axis, mesothelioma. As we already discussed in the anatomy, we know no, pleural pressure will be normally negative in the normal lung. So when it becomes a... a more negative because of the lung collapse or athlete excess, there will be a collection of pleural fluid in the pleural space, resulting in pleural effusion and decreased lymphatic drainage or complete blockage, including thoracic duct obstruction or rupture. Any malignancy or trauma leading to thoracic duct rupture or obstruction can lead to pleural effusion. These are the variable mechanisms of pleural effusion. So, classification of pleural effusion. Plural effusion are generally classified as transudate or exudate based on the mechanism of fluid formation and plural fluid chemistry. Transudate result from imbalance in the oncotic and hydrostatic pressure, whereas exudate are the result of inflammation of the pleura or the decreased lymphatic drainage. Transudate plural effusions are seen in congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, hepatic hydrothorax, Atlet axis, which may be due to malignancy or pulmonary embolism, hyperalbuminemia, nephrotic syndrome, myxedema, and constrictive pericarditis. Exudative pleural effusion seen in tuberculosis, paranemonic. Any infection etiology can lead to exudative pleural effusion. And malignancy, most commonly lung or breast cancer, lymphoma, and leukemia. Less commonly seen in ovarian carcinoma. GIT, uh, stomach cancer, sarcomas, and melanoma. Pulmonary embolism, collagen vascular condition, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, pancreatitis. So what are the clinical features of pleural effusion? The clinical features are variable and are often related to the underlying disease process. Dyspnea is the most common symptom associated with pleural effusion. Patient will feel breathlessness, which will be aggravated with exertion. They will tell it is an insidious onset, which is progressive, and the duration of the dyspnea will be about weeks duration. And the cuff in patient with pleural effusion is often mild and non-productive. So mostly patient may feel come with dry cuff. More severe cuff or the production of purulent or bloody sputum suggests underlying pneumonia or endobronchial lesions. Test pain. It will be resulting from the pleural irritation. And if the chest pain patient complain, it raises the suspicion of the exudative etiology, such as pleural infection, mesothelioma, or pulmonary infarction. The pleuritic chest pain will be sharp, thin, prickling, and it will be aggravated with deep inspiration. It will be mostly in the localized and it won't be radiating or referring to the other sites. The additional symptoms are other symptoms in association with pleural effusion may suggest the underlying disease process. Increase in lower extremity edema, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea may all occur with congestive heart failure. And night sweat, fever, hemoptysis, and weight loss should suggest tuberculosis as the etiology. Hemoptysis also raises the possibility of malignancy other endotracheal or endobronchial pathology or pulmonary infarction. Hemoptysis is expectation of blood and sputum. An acute febrile episode, pulmonary sputum production and pleuritic chest pain may occur in patient with the effusion associated with pneumonia. So what is the workup in a patient of a pleural effusion? A detailed history, examination of the patient, which shows Decreased chest wall expansion, stony dull note on percussion, diminished bed sounds on auscultation, decreased capital vocal parameters and vocal resonance, and any signs of the underlying disease. Uh, also, the tracheal portion and mediastinum portion should be looked for. If it is a massive pleural effusion, the trachea will be shifted to the opposite side, and the mediastinum should be shifted to the opposite side, which is shown as a apical symptoms 
shift into the later in so investigations chest radiology and ultrasonography diagnostic aspiration and other additional investigation test so in chest radiography posterior anterior and upper chest radiograph shows in this pic isolated left side pleural effusion a loss of left later cost of any angle here in the left side lower zone we can see a blunting of cost of any angle and homogeneous opacity see this is the left mild pleural effusion here the trachea is in midline and uh, the heart mediastinum also with not a normal portion it is not shifted so how to differentiate a fluid exudate or transudate the test first proposed by light have become the standard to differentiate whether the fluid is exudate or transudate the fluid is considered as exudate if any of the following are found that is the ratio of pleural flow to serum protein greater than 0.5 ratio of pleural flow to serum ldh lactate dehydrogenase greater than 0.6 pleural flow to ldh greater than 2/3 the upper limit of normal serum value of ldh if on, on this up three criteria if any one of this present then the fluid is considered exudate so treatment of pleural effusion transudative effusion are managed by treating the underlying medical disorder so if it is congestive heart failure we should give the lasics diuretics and treat the effusion and if it is pancreatitis we should treat the pancreatitis if it is renal failure you should treat the renal failure so it depend on the underlying disorder only we should treat the transudative effusion however regardless of whether transudative or exudative large refractory pleural effusion causing severe respiratory symptom can be drained to provide symptomatic relief means if the patient complain of severe breathlessness and if he has deep saturation then he should need therapeutic glucosynthesis to remove the fluid along with underlying treatment disorder so the management of exudative effusion depends on the underlying etiology of effusion pneumonia malignancy and tb can cause for most exudative pleural effusion so if it is tuberculosis patient should get a uh, anti tubercular drug treatment for 6 months and if pneumonia if pneumonia should be treated and if it is malignancy he should may undergo surgery chemotherapy or radiotherapy most of the time the malignant pleural effusions are most recurrent and it may need pleural disease complicated paraneumonic effusion and emphysema should be drained to prevent development of fibrosing pleuritis so if any complication happen emphysema that is first collection in pleural space it should be drained immediately or else it may lead to fibrothorax malignant effusion are usually drained to palliate symptom and may refer pleural disease to prevent recurrence so any patient with malignancy will present with a uh, history of breathlessness which is more severe it should be drained and he need a therapeutic glucosynthesis to reduce his breathlessness later he may require pleural disease also as a tool to prevent recurrence so this is all about pleural effusion so next we'll discuss about bronchial asthma so what is bronchial asthma asthma is a heterogeneous disease which is usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation it is defined by history of respiratory symptom such as wheeze shortness of breath chest tightness and cough the vary over time and in intensity together with variable expiratory air flow limitation so this is the definition of asthma under gina guideline the, the four predominant symptom are wheeze shortness of breath chest tightness and cough So, what are the risk factors and triggers involved in asthma? Endogenous factors: ATP, airway hyperresponsiveness, ethnicity, gender, genetic predisposition. What are the environmental factors involved in asthma? Indoor allergens, allergens in the outdoor, which include fungi, pollen, obesity, occupational sensitizers, any parasitic infection, respiratory infection in the early childhood, viral infection. social economic status tobacco smoking active and passive so what are the trigger factors involved in asthma means this trigger factors will involve in exacerbation of the bronchial asthma and patient will present with acute onset of breathlessness so what are the most common triggering factor allergens especially house dust mite 
animal dander, cockroach, indoor fungi, perennial allergens, and seasonal pollen. Any changes in the weather, cold air, and thunder storms. Any drugs, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, AC inhibitor, aspirin, beta blockers, and NSAIDs. And why this uh, NSAID is causing asthma exacerbation is it will lead to inhibitor prostaglandin production. So there will be a more production of leukotrienes. And this leukotrienes B4 and is a bronchoconstrictor, which will lead to increased airway obstruction and which will lead to increased presentation of breathlessness in the asthmatic patient. And any exercise and hyperventilation, extreme emotional expression, laughing and stress, any irritant, household spray, paint or fumes, any respiratory infections, any sulfur dioxide and pollutant gases, any tobacco smoking. So what are the pathology in the bronchial asthma of the patient? A novel antigen exposure to at risk individual. So as we discussed the risk factors, the patient at risk, if we exposed to some antigen exposure, there will be a trapping of antigen in the mucus lining in the airway of the patient. This antigen will be taken up by antigen presenting cell, mostly dendritic cell. And this dendritic cell will travel to the pulmonary lymph node. This, they will present the antigen to the naive CD4 T cell in the pulmonary lymph node. There will be a development of allergic inflammation following TH2 differentiation. So here the CD4 cell will get activated and will uh, differentiate into TH2 cell type, which will result in inflammation. So if the re-challenge with the sensitization antigen by the any other signals, so if your patient is uh, exposure to the same antigen again, the dendritic cell will secrete chemokines and there will be the equipment of TH2 differentiated CD4 cells to the airway. So in a sensitized individual, the repeated antigen exposure will lead to the equipment of TH2 cell into the airway, which will secrete the cytokines, interleukin 4, 5, 30, and the B cells will bind to the high affinity immunoglobulin E receptor on the mast cell to produce antigen-specific immunoglobulin E. So the inhaled antigen crosslink the membrane-bound immunoglobulin E receptor on the mast cell. So the B cells will produce the antibodies immunoglobulin E on the mast cell and it uh, to produce the antigen-specific IgE. And the inhaled antigen will bind with the antigen-specific immunoglobulin E receptor on the mast cell. So there will be a mast cell degranulation happening. It will release to preformed and synthesis mediator from the mast cell. So which will result in all symptoms and the airway inflammation. So here the picture showing uh, there is an antigen presenting cell which will uh, differentiate it to CD4 uh, TH2 type cells and the B cells also produce an immunoglobulin E is, uh, antibodies and the antigen get linked into the mast cell surface. That is the inhaled allergen or any cold air or any factor which are the triggering factor which uh, lead to the inflammation. So the mast cell, the mediators will get released. Either it can be uh, already preformed mediator or newly synthesized mediator. So the mediators include prostaglandins, leukotrienes, platelet activating factor, and histamines. This will all will produce airway mucus edema, mucus secretion, and airway contraction. And uh, also it will uh, include tryptase, the another mediators, which will uh, cause uh, conversion of uh, a kininogen to the bradykinin. This also will result in mucus edema, mucus secretion, and contraction. So the overall airway inflammation happening and resulting in airway obstruction and bronchoconstriction, and the patient will complain breathlessness, cough. Okay. So the clinical features of asthma. The patterns of respiratory symptoms that are characteristic of asthma are. Uh, Respiratory symptom of wheeze, shortness of breath, cough and or chest tightness. In patients, especially adults, they will experience more than one of this type of symptom. Among these four, they will have more than one type of symptom. And the symptom are often worse at night or in the early morning. And symptom vary over time and intensity. Symptoms are triggered by viral infection, cold, exercise, allergen exposure, changes in weather, water or any irritant, such as car extract fumes, smoke or strong smells. So how do you diagnose a bronchial asthma? Mainly by the spirometry, obstructive airway disease with positive bronchodilator reversibility. So there will be a decrease in ratio of FE1, FEC below 0 0.70 and after giving a salbutamol puff, two puff about a 
fold and microgram uh, after 15 to 20 minutes if we repeat the same spirometry there will be a variation there will be more than a increase of 12 percent or 200 ml in the if we want value in the spirometry test so with positive bronchodilator visibility with obstructive airway disease pattern this is bronchial asthma if it is copd there will be a no bronchodilator reversibility present this is the main differentiating features in diagnosis of asthma and the copd and the copd patient will have symptoms persistent throughout the year where the asthmatic patient have symptoms of seasonal variation more common in the winter season usually they will present so what is the treatment of asthma inhaler therapy long acting bronchodilator long acting beta adrenergic agonist with inhaled corticosteroid is the treatment for asthma any asthma patient need inhaled corticosteroid as the mainstay without that the airway inflammation won't resolve only with the bronchodilator it won't be enough so what are the non pharmacological interventions in the treatment of asthma avoidance of cold weather allergies and exposure smoking cessation avoidance of occupational exposure especially in the occupational asthma some occupational are more risk of getting asthma especially some paint or dyes or some gloves some industry workers they are more risk of getting asthma they should get avoided so what is acute severe asthma so acute severe asthma is peak expiratory flow 33 to 50% predicted less than 200 liter per minute heart rate more than or equal to 110 beat per minute respiratory rate more than or equal to 25 breath per minute inability to complete the sentence in one breath so the life threatening features of acute severe asthma are peak expiratory flow less than 33% predicted that is less than 100 liter per minute saturation of oxygen less than 92% or pao2 less than 60 mm mercury especially even after being treated with oxygen a normal or raised pacco2 silent chest silent chest is if a known asthmatic patient presenting with the silent chest that is no breath sounds heard on auscultation it is due to complete bronchospasm and bronchoconstriction which is due to no air entry so only no breath sounds are heard in auscultation and other features cyanosis feeble respiratory effect bradycardia or arrhythmia hypotension exhaustion delirium coma so near fatal asthma is raised pacco2 and or requiring mechanical ventilation with raised inflation pressure so if any patient present with acute severe asthma or life threatening features if any of this present he need immediate attention or else he can progress to worsening deterioration and patient may end up in death also so what are the treatment of any acute severe life threatening asthma oxygen high concentration to maintain saturation spo2 more than 92% so oxygen can be given to either face mask or nasal spray to maintain saturation rising pacco2 is a warning sign of a life threatening attack and not to reduce oxygen concentration so if a abg is taken and showing rising pacco2 then the patient need a immediate attention if he need high concentration of oxygen and any assisted ventilation the failure to attain appropriate oxygenation assisted ventilation is any non invasive ventilation should be given to the patient to maintain the gas exchange and to remain relieved of the symptoms so high doses of inhaled bronchodilators saba is the agent of choice saba is short acting bronchodilator agent along with ipratropium can be given and systemic glucocorticoids is needed in all acute severe cases systemic glucocorticoid is any tablet prednisolone for 5 to 7 days can be given on an acute presentation intravenous injection of hydrocortisone can be given in the, uh, all patient with acute severe cases of asthma and the patient should be continuously monitored if for any deterioration if any patient goes for a uh, arterial mental sensorium coma or continuous desaturation he should be needed immediate attention and endotracheal intubation should be done so to maintain the all the saturation respiratory rate and the vital signs so the vital signs should be continuously monitored abg should be taken and the patient should be monitored and safe thank you